Meow. It's time to pet the copycat. In this video, I'm going to be painting from a reference, which means I'm going to have to get values, tones, and colors as closely as I can to the original work. The model I'll be painting today is a captain of the Duchies of Vinci from One Page Rules. The reason I'm picking this model is because while I was in the Discord, someone had posted the concept art used for them, and I knew I just had to do that color scheme. It has a dark armor with maroon and violet leathers, as well as touches of white asymmetrically around the model. Now at first I primed this guy in a light gray primer. This is kind of the usual primer I use for general everyday application. But in the end the armor will turn out pretty dark, so I think it's just going to be easier to start with that dark color instead. So using some water, thinner, and mostly black with a touch of white in my airbrush, I give him a good base layer. Because I used a matte primer beforehand, the mixture can actually go on quite thin, and I don't have to worry about beading like you get with some can primers, which are satin or semi-gloss. While I think those will protect your model more, I do find them hard to paint over. When I'm getting towards the end of a model, I tend to become struck with what I call Paintingus Lethargium, which means I get lazy with the last few colors. Usually by that time, my palette is drying up, my paints are over thinned, and I just want to finish the model, but I don't want to restart all my setup. Because I tend to leave weapons for last, they sometimes turn out to be the worst part of the models. So because I want to show how I do wood on these well, that's where I'm going to start. Also because they're not part of the reference. Starting with a base coat of a medium shade brown, not too dark or too light. Adding some yellow ochre and some white to my brown, I get the finest brush I have. Because these models are pretty tiny and flat, I'm going to be painting in my own wood grain. I find the best way to get yourself started with wood grain and not making it just straight lines is to paint a wood knot first. A diamond shape oval with a line in the center should do, then follow the lines to the edges. Now it's just a simple task of painting the other lines parallel until you reach an edge. The other key is to make sure every corner is filled. Even if it looks like I've run out of space for a line, I'll add curved ones or just dots to fill in that space. If parts are hard to reach and do any curving, like the part next to the helm here, just some straight lines will do. If you're not sure about your skill to be able to do this, then just highlight the edges. Since the grain's not on the model itself, no one's going to miss it if it's not there. It's just something extra I like to do. I also highlight these grain lines towards the center a bit brighter, as a wash of sorts is going over top this, so they need to be visible through it. For the wash, it's actually going to be an ink. To me, if you're trying to have a lacquered wood effect, then the best thing to use is something equivalent to a lacquer, though I do mix it with some medium to have it go on in a smooth layer, covering the whole flat surface but pulling it back towards the valleys where I want it to pool. And this is going to be a multi-coat situation. After it dried the first time, I do the same again, but with a bit of black in the mix and only focusing on the valleys. Time to move on to the armor. So in the reference, the metal was actually pretty dark, barely hitting a 50% gray by my eye. So I'm starting with only a bit brighter than my base coat and painting it everywhere except the very deepest of recesses. I'll focus on the chest plate for this video since it's the best viewing angle. Now one of my other painting faults is I never mix up enough paint for what I need. So I'm going to fix that first and make a large mix of this black. Then just adding some white, I'm going to follow the light as we see it in the reference. So this time the light's coming from over his left shoulder it looks like. So I split the armor in half and pull the lighter gray up towards the pointed edge in the middle, then stop. Now we've got a direct contrast between the light side and the dark side of the armor. Though the other side does still catch some light, so I'm going to outline it against the edges. Adding a bit more white, I do the same thing again, this time keeping the paint pretty light. A good way to do that with a wet palette is to drag the paint over the palette multiple times over and over. It draws moisture out into the paint in your bristles, makes sure it's evenly thinned, and drags out any dry paint that may have ended up in the mix. Now I feel like I jumped up a bit too much in brightness with this, but I go with it for now. Drawing the thin paint with my brush to those edges I laid in with the layer before. You can really see the contrast now, but I only want to go up to a 50% gray in the end, so I've got to tone this down a bit. To tone it down, I do a small mix of the lighter highlight and the shade I used previously, thinning it down again. Then I find the point where the light meets the dark and stipple in between. 
making sure I only ever lift my brush on the very center line between those contrasts. So as a last step, we want to do some highlighting on the very most tips. Now normally I do this in something quite bright, but because I want to leave things darker like the artwork, I'm only doing this in about a 40% gray, basically just the last mix with some more white, only getting the tips and edges that would reflect the most light. Moving on to the red and white, I'm doing them together, at least the base coats, as the white appears on top of the red and is a bit pink in nature in the artwork. So starting with a base coat of pure red mixed in with a black will give me a good start on both. I paint all the frills, the lower cloth boot, the feathers, and fletching, which can be easy to miss, but will make a nice pop of red or white on the weapon, and the sash along his chest. When it comes to highlighting, this is where you can take two paths. Path number one is to do what I'm doing and only highlight the inner parts of the frills with the pure red. They're quite small in area and really won't need more than just a dark red with a light red highlight to get their point across. No need for blending and only a few layers. This is where the second path comes in. If you're doing these as part of an army and don't want to dedicate too much time to each trooper, who all look quite similar to the captain here, or if you just don't think you'd be steady enough to pick out the small white details on the frills, make it all red. Just highlight the whole frill with the pure red. As for the feather, we can use something I learned from one of my previous videos to make it really bright by using a pink to fill in the highlights before going over them again with the pure red to make sure they're nice and vibrant. To do the white, I actually want to start with a desaturated pink and it'll actually work next to and on top of the red I already put down. Though instead of using the red to make the pink, I'm using a red oxide which is kind of more of a reddish brown, just so that the pink doesn't come out too vibrant and mixing it with a light gray instead of a white. The goal here is to use a small or well-pointed brush to base coat all the white parts. Luckily, the frills are small enough that they'll probably only need one coat. The bad part is you got painted armor on one side and painted red on the others, which means I'm being painstakingly careful about how this goes down always turning the model as needed to give myself the best possible angle where the brush won't touch anything else. And of course making sure not to forget his sash and feather after the arduous task of the frills is done. Luckily everything for the white from here on out gets easier. I'll be doing two layered highlights, starting with a white with only a bit of the pink in it, which means the previous pink layer was actually the shade. This is easier because I don't have to paint anything connected to anything else, just pulling the thinned off white to the edges where the frills are sharpest. For the cloth parts, I just follow the folds and paint lines along them. For the pure white, I want to make sure it's thinned out, but I still want to have some control over it, so cut in some mixing medium. Then I just follow the edges of all the frills, trying to keep it mostly towards my light source. And on the cloth, getting all the high points of the folds, especially along the sash. I do a couple passes of it as well, just to make sure those lights are really light. Only a couple colors left to go now, and it's the two leather choices. There's the light purple brown leather, and the dark red on the pouches and straps as shown on the artwork. This is where mixing will be important to get the colors needed since there's not many paint lines with purple browns as a default. So to mix it up ourselves, it's as easy as just putting some purple in brown. But in my case, to make the brown, I have to use some orange, red oxide, and black first. But of course, a pre-mixed brown would be easier. Then it's just a case of base coating all the purple leather parts. The dangles around his hips, the asymmetric leather glove, and the tail feathers of the clockwork bird. From there I add some white and mixing medium to the mix and do a gentle coat of it, leaving the upper parts the base color and pulling the paint towards the bottom of each dangle, not worrying if I cover the rivets for now. Then I just add more white and a bit more of the brown because it seemed a bit too purple, and stipple some texture onto the edges. I'm using a large messy brush for this because it doesn't matter too much about being neat, just staying within the bounds of the leather. And for a last layer, taking a detail brush and stippling some lighter texture onto the very edges that would see the most wear. Now we have to bring it all together. For that I'm doing thinner, or water if you don't have thinner, some mixing medium, 
and the base mix, just a tiny bit, along with a bit of black. Load the brush up with it, then wipe it along a paper towel until you barely see the pigment, but you know it's still damp. Then cover the surface of the dangles, but lift the brush where the rivets are so that everything pools at that location. I've left one of them undone intentionally, just so you can see the difference it makes. How it blends those textures, brings the color back, and shades the rivets, in one pretty simple step. Now that we've got some idea about the process for the leather, it's just a case of repeating it now, but with the darker red brown instead. So leaving out the orange and purple and only using the red ochre, but making it really dark to start, as in the artwork it's almost black. With this I'm painting the bags and straps, sword hilt, and the glove and boot connectors. Then just following the previous process, highlighting up, then applying a final shade with a thin coat. After that it was just a case of repainting the rivets in the same dark grey to half grey I did for the armour, and to give the birdie a copper noggin. I'm very happy with the results of the model as it came out very close to the artwork. There's no shame in using a reference for your colour scheme, especially if you're just starting out learning techniques. It's like following a recipe. Just because someone told you the ingredients doesn't mean it was any less work to make the cake. I actually want to start a series like this one, where I paint from references using either 2D artworks, 3D models from video games, or even sports team colors, and try and recreate them on a model that kind of suits them. If that's something you'd like to see, let me know in the comments, and subscribe so you can see more videos like this one, and I can see you on my next painting journey.